The second person was, and this came as a surprise to me, and I still don't have any particulars on the cause, but uh, Leaping Lanny Poffo, and uh, better known to the WWF fans of the, what, 80s as the genius. But Lanny, uh, um, again, was always kind of a health fanatic and worked out. I last saw him at... I guess with the Charlotte Fan Fest would have been four years ago, maybe five years ago, whatever. Probably the last one that I went to, I believe. Um, and he looked great, and I think he was 68 years old. Um, you know, I uh, I want to say that then, I, maybe I've talked to him on the phone. No, I tell a lie. I saw him there in Charlotte, probably 2018-ish, talked to him on the phone in 2019, I believe. And, uh, you know, so we had, we had not heard he was in any ill health or anything, don't know what was going on. But the thing that surprised me was he'd been living in Ecuador for the past few years. And you mentioned that you'd seen something, maybe his new wife or fiancé, financier, whatever, uh, had family there. But I didn't know he was in Ecuador, but I, I hated to hear that. Lanny was a nice guy. Nobody had anything bad to say about him. and. You know, one of those guys, he was probably more of a character outside the ring than he was inside the ring, and that might be saying something. But um, he is the first guy that I ever saw, and to my knowledge, I don't know, can anybody, I'm sure somebody in Lucha or Mexico, maybe the Guerrero family, but the first person in American wrestling I ever saw do a moonsault. And because La Leaping Lanny... <laughs> Lanny was very gymnastic, and that's back when that was not something you really needed to do or anybody did in wrestling. Of course, he was, what, 6'2 or 6'3 and 220 or 30 pounds and had a really good upper body and et cetera, so when he was doing cartwheels and backflips off the top rope and whatever, it, it still fit in with the wrestling of the time. Because you're like, wow, he's a big guy, he's doing that shit. And he was a baby face, predominantly in the ICW days to counteract his brother, Randy Savage. And then, um, did how much of the old ICW tapes have you seen, the TVs? I've seen most of what's out there. I don't even know. And but I don't know how much of what's out there is the overall, whatever, four-year run or whatever. Right. Well, and see, there's not, I don't even have uh, the early stuff on video because, well, they came on the air before I got my first VCR, so somewhere in 1979. That was right after the Poffos had come back from working for who? Al Zink in Nova Scotia or wherever. It's crazy. He broke in in the middle of a wrestling war. In Georgia. Yes. They were always kind of on, you know, in the middle of where there was a wrestling war going on. Uh, but the the story was Angelo Poffo, who had been involved as a top heel and also an investor in Phil Golden's All-Star Wrestling that had tried to do Southern Illinois and Western Kentucky and Paducah, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, that area, and had expanded across into trying to run against Nick Goulas's towns in 73, 74, but they were really Jarrett's towns, but Louisville and Evansville and et cetera. Um, Angelo tried to do the same thing with his own company because the, the Poffos were from Illinois and Southern Illinois, that Harrisburg area down there and, and uh, the entire Phil Golden area, was something he was interested in. It was an offshoot of his home. And they tried to do the same thing and joined with Ronnie Garvin, Bob Roop, Boris Malenko, and who am I leaving out? Uh, Bob Roop, Boris Malenko, Ron Bob Garvin. Orton, Bob Orton Jr. Ron Wright. Well, Ron Wright, but Bob Orton Jr. specifically, the four guys, Ron Wright never worked ICW. No, but remember, before ICW started, the Poffos came down to work All-Star in Knoxville right. with those guys. Well, that, that's where I was going with this. For the purpose of this exercise, though, when Angelo had started ICW, because they were already outlaws, they were coming down to help the guys in Knoxville, but they absorbed, when the Knoxville outlaw promotion didn't last long, they absorbed Orton, Garvin, Malenko, and Roop. 
And and that Ron just didn't wasn't interested enough to come to Lexington and do their whole thing up here and in that end of the territory. But anyway, the point was Lanny was the top baby face for Angelo and Randy was the top heel. And at the time, nobody knew they were brothers. And because they were so completely different, the only thing that would give it away was the deep voice. They both had the deep voices, but since they were so completely opposite, you had to be get to the level of the, you know, the local hanger on bell ringer smart fan or whatever level to know that they were related. And you know, Garvin and Roop and Orton and Malenko, Malenko didn't didn't stay long. And I, as I recall, he just moved back to Florida and retired. Roop and, and uh, Garvin stayed longer than the, the most of them. Roop and Orton ended up leaving after, what, two years and, and getting a spot with Watts. And Garvin was there for quite a while and finally left and I think went to work for Ole in Atlanta. But you could tell that Lanny and Randy were the guys obviously Angelo depended on and even and no and Angelo was the miser under a hood because he didn't want to as old as he was then he didn't want anybody to see his face and also the, to know that he was Lanny's father. So when the show first went on the air in Lexington they had done a marathon taping at uh, the old Channel 62 now it's Channel 36 in their studio and Rip Rogers was just breaking in at that point. He had worked a little bit for Nick Goulas and had met Randy and Lanny because they'd been working down there. And Randy taught Rip, you know, majority of what he knew about wrestling at that point. And past that and the guys from Knoxville, it was kind of, you know, Doug Vines and Jeff Sword were these, uh, you know, outlaw guys. There was no independence outlaw guys at the time from, Eastern Kentucky and a guy named Big Boy Williams. And later on, they'd get Pez Watley, but they didn't have him right there. So it was a Hoot kind Gibson. of Gibson. They had a Hoot Gibson. They had an actual Hoot Gibson. And boy, he was about five foot six and tubby. And he was a guy from East Tennessee that could get him some towns. <laughs> but it was a motley assortment of, of talent. You had these, you know, international superstars in Roop and Garvin and Orton and Malenko. And then you had one of the best wrestlers in the world, Randy Savage, that nobody almost had ever heard of. And then you had underneath guys, it was fucking brutal. And of course, then every once in a while, they'd find somebody. Crusher Broomfield became the one-man gang. And you could tell at the start, you know, he was something. But the TV show, when they first did a, the, ta the first taping to go on the air, they did like eight, eight one-hour shows in the same day. And not only did they do the old deal where they had a backdrop with like shaded figures painted on it like for the audience, but they couldn't even fill up two rows in the studio. So they had the underneath guys and the job guys put on coats and hats and go sit in the second row and fucking just clap and keep their heads down. So they had a crowd. But they put this and it came on Saturday nights at 1130, which was almost about the time that the station went off the air back in those days. But where I was going with all this was if you overlooked the most low budget presentation, especially at the start you've ever seen and this 20 fans, maybe in the studio and the, you know, the, the announcer that they had usually didn't really know too much about wrestling but there's Randy Savage having matches with Ronnie Garvin or Randy and Lanny. I think they did a deal. I'm pretty sure it was the whole hour where they did a ICW world heavyweight title match in front of 15 people in the studio and aired it on at that time, like three stations late at night where Lanny and Savage went an hour and it was fucking because they were doing more advanced in ring stuff than a lot of people were doing at that point in time. And you didn't get, main event matches on TV. And I know some people can say, well, a main event in a fucking phone booth, but this was again, Randy Savage. So, you know, there was moments of sublime, you know, wow, this is fucking great wrestling on that show. And moments of this is the cheesiest booking and the most low rent job guys and the most 
haphazard production you've ever seen in your life. But it was, a, and then they got a little bit better the second and third year as a television show. But the first ones, man, I wish I had tapes of some of those. It was insane. But Lanny, again, doing the moon salts and the high drop kicks and stuff. But he was a, he was a nerdy baby face, because he was the classic white meat, you know, baby face that didn't curse or smoke or drink or thing. He, he would be the guy drinking the milk and opposite a guy like Randy Savage, who was starting to, for the fans in Eastern Kentucky and the, they did do some, some business down in the mountain towns in Eastern Kentucky when Southeastern was out of business and Jarrett didn't go over that far. They probably drew better houses in places like Combs and Manchester than they did in Lexington and Frankfurt. But the young guys were starting to get behind Randy Savage, kind of like the free bird effect that, that it would have in Dallas a few years later. This was 1979, 1980. But Savage was so fucking, he, he was coming out still doing kind of the same interviews. It's just there was no budget to it, which made him seem even more like a fucking madman. He wouldn't come out and have this, sequin you know macho man robe and elizabeth and he'd be spinning around he'd come out in goddamn whatever he wore to the station that day which looked like what he fucking slept in for the past three days and he'd go "Ooh, macho man dig it and he'd pull a fucking handful of confetti out of his own jacket pocket and throw it up over his own head and you know but you thought he was fucking insane and then here was lanny was the opposite of that was the soft-spoken and, you know, deep voice, but articulate baby face that's going to right a wrong. And it was, it was, it was some interesting shit. Possibly over-articulate, if you actually want fans to... Possibly over-articulate, yes, because he would, he would run off and leave them sometimes, because Lanny was a very smart guy. But anyway, and then, you know, later on when they made up with Jarrett and Lanny was a heel because he was with Randy and, and they were doing a thing with Lawler, but, and then, of course, you know, the genius, the poetry was all his. That was kind of, you know, it was a very true-to-life gimmick. And I saw people tweeting, you know, the, the Frisbees and everything that uh, he would have the poem on it and he'd sign the Frisbee and then sail it out a into the crowd after he read it. I'm sure now people be calling Stephen P. New was fucking putting some kid's eye out. But, uh, and as I mentioned, I'd seen him in, in Charlotte and talked to him on the phone. He is the one I found out, Mary Furpo, Mary Freeze, that uh, is Pampiro Furpo's daughter, big fan of the show, had never met her and didn't know about it. And Lanny had called me out of the blue one day and said, I, w I want you to know, Jim, that she's, she's a wonderful person. She's not a stalker, but I didn't want to give her your information without asking your permission. I said, no, please. And, and I said, who gave it to you, Lanny? Yeah, no, come on now. Um, I did say, I actually said, how did you get my nut? No. Um, but anyway, so, so uh, I just, anyway, I hate to hear that. So now all three Poffos are gone. And that's, that's a pretty heavy family. That's a pretty crazy thing. Again, I mean, it was only three of them, but there's been a Poffo in or around wrestling for 70 years. And now, yep, that's it. And... Well, think about this. Angelo started out uh, in his career. He was on the Dumont Network broadcasts. And Randy Savage not only ended up being on network television, NBC, whatever, uh, 35 years later, but you, since they put him, you know, he's all of the home video and all of the blah, 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 he's seen now in more play Randy Savages in more places than you could almost see wrestling, even though no, not as many people are watching it, it's available everywhere. So there's been some member of the family on television or being able to be seen by the public all that time. And, and you know, it's the profile is bigger now than it ever was. I wonder what happens to Randy's. I don't know if a state would cover it, but you know, the, all the issues where they license out the Randy Savage stuff. So it's beyond just WWE. I could be wrong, but I think they were dealing with Lanny. Well, but at the same time, I get Randy was married. So at that's the time, true. that's true. 
that he passed away so there would be somebody to still have control over it or whatever. Even I mean, it would probably have gone to his wife anyway, but I'm sure Lanny was the spokesperson for whatever. But anyway, the, um, the noted humorist Scott Cornish and me were texting about it the other day. Noted humorist, the the wrestling humorist Scott Cornish, and he actually summed up my thoughts with this text. My reaction to Lanny Poffo's passing has been in this order: surprise, sadness, wildly inappropriate humor. Rest in peace, Lee the Gladdy. And I have to admit, because that is part of the story, just because so many people he even enjoyed talking about it. Well, wait, Alan Blackstock say- on Twitter posted a bunch of Lanny's poems from, I think, the WWF years, and I found myself reading them to myself and ending everyone the same way with, also, I suck my own dick. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I know. And I think a lot of other people did that, too, because it's a funny part of the Lanny Poffo story. No, go ahead and say it, because you got to say it the right way. He has the greatest quote of all time when people, he said, people ask me if I'm gay. No, the only penis I've ever had in my mouth is my own. See, I didn't even know that was the line he used, actually. Yes. (laughs) And because it's true. And and the thing is, and that is... (laughs) When you got close around the wrestling back in the early 80s, you would hear this story because Lanny not only was a, a gymnast, but it was very flexible and was flexible. And Here, to watch. To entertain, you know, various people, either in the locker room or, you know, whatever, wherever the case may be, at, you know, weddings and bar mitzvahs, wherever the <laughs> thing yeah, came where? up. He always said it was an old parlor trick. What well, yeah. parlor? What well, parlor are people doing this trick in? <laughs> in a number of parlors. Um, <laughs> and I, I, you know, used to know a girl in Dayton that was amazed by it. Always would request to see it, but Man, nevertheless. I, I am so bored in this locker room. Does anyone have a deck of cards? Shit, I left the cards somewhere. Does anyone well, have a, a comic book or a magazine? Oh, no, no one has anything. Oh, wait a minute. Watch this. <laughs> oh, shit, there's Lanny blowing himself. <laughs> and Sam, and, 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 it, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to say this next day. It was really amazing because it wasn't like, you could maybe understand if it was Virgil or Robert Fuller. But while while, while it, he was not shortchanged by nature, it was more of the 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 element of the flexibility rather than the extension of the. It's not how big you are; it's how much you can bend it half and suck your it's, own. T- yes, it's 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 it was he could, you know, because you're bending there not at the waist, but you're. <laughs> it's sort of almost an unnatural direction that the spine has to go. To. But we are definitely sorry to hear about yes. the, uh, no, and I, I kid, I never had any issues with Lanny and we were always very friendly. So I hate to hear about this, but I guess that'll teach you to move to Ecuador. I don't know what he was the picture of health. Hey, how different do you think his career would have been? Whether you like the gimmick or not, he was the guy for it. If he had come in as the genius versus coming in as leaping Lanny, throwing Frisbees, kind of getting beat everywhere. Yeah. And then he became the genius. Well, it probably would have helped because again, and I guess a a lot of people may not even remember that they did bring him in. And of course, because Savage is on top, I'm sure, and you know, Pat Patterson would, would, uh, would have known Angelo for years and Lanny, uh, just as leaping Lanny Poffo, the baby face in 1985 or six or whatever it was in the WWF was not going to get over because he was way too white bread, you know, nerdy baby face, territorial kind of baby face. But uh, he had when, none of the qualities you want in a baby. He was like, I wear a suit of armor. <laughs> well, no, but, <laughs> but no, that was after he didn't, they didn't send him out there in a suit of armor at first. That You know, but that's what I'm saying is then they decided, well, we'll make him the genius or a heel or the, you know, the pompous fellow uh, afterwards. And he probably would have got more heat if he hadn't been been beaten around the horn. But in, in a lot of cases, 
he took heat because he got jobs because of, you know, Randy, but they didn't necessarily, because he might get hired because of Randy, they didn't necessarily put the effort into his booking or his presentation or his gimmick that they would have if it, if they'd have just hired him and he could have done a better job with it. He was kind of pigeonholed in the, in the middle. How long was he on the WCW payroll? Remember they were going to bring him back as Gorgeous George? There are photos out there of him with blonde hair because Randy owned oh, the yeah. IP for Gorgeous George, and then he just got paid for years and they never used him. Well, Robert, Lanny was a bleach blonde heel for the Sheik in 70, what, five or six, though. So th- th- he had experience with the uh, the hair bleaching. But at that point, yeah, that w- he's one of the people that got a job from WCW just to 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 breathe and go to the mailbox. But at that by that time he'd been in the business for fuck 20 years. I don't blame him for just wanting to sit home if they were willing to send him a check at that point. Well, we uh send our sympathies to the family and friends of Leaping Lanny Papo. Well, we know he had friends, but we've just established does he have any family left, for heaven's sake? Uh Judy, their mother's passed away here not too long ago. Angelo's been gone. Randy, etc. There were maybe well, somebody will have to call uh, uh, Gorgeous George the uh, the valet and see if she can carry on the name. <laughs> I don't know if that'd be the pick. There may be some heat. Yeah, there. what a little heat. <laughs> 